Now, ironically, Senator Yee has been a major advocate for gun control. 120 miles per hour. Yeah, tragically, he collided with the car in West Hills, which killed him and injured two people in the mm -hmm. car. The residents of this neighborhood are still shocked by the shootout. For what? Tell me for what? In this video, we'll explore the fascinating stories of individuals who lived double lives, and some of them had surprising secrets. As we explore their tales, you'll discover cases where the truth eventually emerged. Huh? I just married her. You just met her and you gave her a ride over here. Often leading to life-altering consequences. From a female spy masquerading as an exotic dancer to an unsuspecting hockey player revealed as an infamous bank robber, here are 20 people who lead double lives and got busted. Number 20. Secret Sins There's a saying that goes, practice what you preach. Unfortunately, some people don't follow their own advice. Bishop Eddie Long was known for his flamboyant and charismatic preaching style. He would drive luxury cars to church and strongly opposed homosexuality, even leading an anti-gay march in Atlanta, Georgia. Long, the senior pastor of the New Birth Missionary Baptist Church in Atlanta, had a massive congregation of over 25,000 members. He frequently organized conferences aimed at changing attendees' sexual orientation, attempting to convert them to heterosexuality. In a surprising development in 2010, four underage teenage boys came forward and filed lawsuits against Long, alleging that he had engaged in inappropriate relationships with them. These boys, three from his church and one from a North Carolina satellite church, claimed that Long put them on the church's payroll, gave them money, expensive gifts, and even took them on international vacations. When questioned about the details of their interactions, the boy's lawyer explained that they described it as something similar to a marriage ceremony involving candles, the exchange of jewelry, and biblical quotes. Long denied these allegations but chose to settle with all four boys out of court instead of proving the allegations false. Later, a fifth boy came forward with a similar claim and also reached an out-of-court settlement. He said, I don't want you just seeing healing, I want you to have access to healing. Number 19. The Fake Beggar Gary Thompson had a motorcycle accident in 1993, which left him in a wheelchair and with mental challenges. As a result, he faced the risk of losing everything and resorted to begging for financial support. People who had sympathy for his difficult situation often gave him money. Please help but but fail. However, it turns out Gary Thompson was faking his condition. He wasn't actually disabled, homeless, or mentally ill. The only truthful part of his story was that he had been temporarily injured in an accident and received a $2.5 million settlement for it. Some residents in Lexington, Kentucky, where he often begged, became suspicious of his true condition. Thompson's deception was exposed when a news reporter heard him speaking normally, without any mental handicap or speech impediment. Later, another reporter used a hidden camera to capture him in the same act. When confronted by a reporter after being exposed, Thompson admitted that he appreciated them catching him and mentioned that he was really good at pretending. He claimed to make around $100,000 a year doing this and added that he was perfectly normal, explaining that pretending to be mentally handicapped helped with begging. Or like a big red and two dollars for bus fare, please. Number 18. Manhattan Madam Anna Gristina seemed like your typical 44-year-old suburban mom of four in New York's Upper East Side. She hailed from Edinburgh, Scotland, and her neighbors thought of her family as just an average private bunch. But when night fell, Anna led a double life as a madam catering to high-end clients, including two billionaires. She managed two brothels worth $10 million and had a roster of over 50 women, some of whom were penthouse magazine models. Her girls were earning $2,000 an hour, all in cash. In February 2012, after an extensive five-year FBI investigation, Anna got arrested, and her bail was set at $2 million. Later, she was released on a $100,000 bond. Things took a turn when one of her business partners decided to cooperate with law enforcement, which forced Anna into making a plea deal. Initially, she claimed to run a dating service, but eventually, she admitted to a single charge of promoting prostitution. As a result, she was sentenced to six months in prison and five years of probation. It just goes to show that things aren't always what they seem on the surface. It's nobody. You cannot go to Walmart and get a job. Number 17. Big Tom Tom Brown may have appeared to be the ideal police officer to the public, 
but behind the scenes, he had a complete disregard for the laws he was supposed to enforce. He gained fame in the police force by killing a wanted gangster who had committed murder. After this, he was assigned to the Purity Squad in the St. Paul Police Department, tasked with cleaning up the city's underworld. However, Brown soon found himself drawn to breaking the law. In 1926, he got arrested for stealing hundreds of gallons of seized liquor during a raid, although the charges were later dropped due to insufficient evidence. While still wearing his police uniform, Brown continued his descent into a life of crime. He accepted bribes and turned a blind eye to illegal activities as a member of the Purity Squad. He developed powerful connections with dangerous individuals, notably Leon Gleckman, known as the Al Capone of St. Paul. Brown's association with Gleckman, who had significant influence in the city council, led to Brown becoming the chief of police. In return, he used his position to eliminate Gleckman's rivals. As suspicions grew about Brown's involvement in rising crime rates, he surprisingly faced no charges. However, a newly elected mayor removed him from the police force due to his close ties to criminal elements, ending his career as a police officer. Number 16 gun control advocate. Prepare to be shocked by a case that rocked California's political community. Former state senator Leland Yee was known for advocating open government and gun control. He even introduced legislation to ban 3D printed weapons. But in March 2014, Yee stunned the entire state when he was indicted for involvement in a criminal enterprise smuggling guns into the country illegally. He joined this international gun trafficking ring because he had accrued a $70,000 debt after losing a mayoral election. He needed to clear this debt to run for the position of Secretary of State in California. Yi had numerous meetings and interactions with an undercover FBI agent posing as a gun buyer. Yi trusted the FBI agent enough to arrange a meeting where the agent would provide fully automatic assault rifles and shoulder-mounted rocket launchers. As a result, Yi was arrested on charges of public corruption and gun trafficking on March 2014. In 2016, he was sentenced to five years in prison. Number 15, Catherine Ann Power. Well, she was on the run for 23 years and on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. This next story is like something out of a Hollywood movie. Back in 1970, when Catherine Ann Power was just 21 and a student at Brandeis University, she and four other activists pulled off a daring robbery at a National Guard armory in Newburyport, Massachusetts. They managed to steal 400 rounds of ammunition, weapons, and even set the facility on fire, causing approximately $125,000 in damages. A few days later they attempted a bank heist. Their goal was to use the stolen money to purchase explosives, intending to supply weapons to the Black Panther Party as a response to the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War. During the bank robbery, one of the group members fatally shot a Boston police officer who had responded to the crime. Power, who was the getaway driver, managed to escape capture and disappeared for over two decades. She eventually settled in Lebanon, Oregon, where she worked in Corvallis and Albany, even teaching cooking classes at Lynn Benton Community College. She adopted the name Alice Metzinger, raised a son, and married a local man. However, in 1993, Power decided that she had been in hiding long enough. She negotiated the terms of her surrender and pleaded guilty to two counts of armed robbery and manslaughter. For her crimes, Power received a sentence of 8 to 12 years in prison for the bank robbery and an additional five years with a $10,000 fine for her involvement in the National Guard armory incident. Number 14. Dr. Pal. Meet Om Pal. A man who worked as a surgeon at a community health center in Saharanpur district, Uttar Pradesh, India, for over 10 years, all while using a fake medical degree. Pal's deception came to light when he reported an extortion call to the police. The caller was attempting to blackmail him, demanding $56,418 to keep his true identity a secret. Despite being a well-known figure in Deoband, Pal was so confident in his deception that he refused to give in and instead informed the police. The police launched an investigation and discovered that Pal had forged an MBBS degree from a Mysore University alumnus named Dr. Rajesh R. During the early 2000s, Pal had worked as a paramedic at the Air Force Base Hospital in Mangalore, where he had befriended Dr. Rajesh R. Before Dr. Rajesh R. relocated abroad, Pal managed to obtain a copy of his MBBS degree. Pal then used this forged degree to secure a job as a surgeon at the Community Health Center in Saharanpur. During his time as a surgeon, Pal performed thousands of operations. Unfortunately, it remains unclear how many patients may have been harmed due to his lack of genuine medical knowledge and skills. Number 13. Gilgo Beach Murders 
This is Rex Hoyerman, a seemingly ordinary guy, a married father of two, an architect, and even a volunteer firefighter. He was active in his local community board and was described as a kind and loving person. But there's a hidden side to his story. On July 14, 2023, Rex Hoyerman was arrested, and the shocking crime he was charged with. The murders of three women, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. All three were sex workers, and their bodies were discovered in the Gilgo Beach area back in 2010. Hoyerman's arrest for these Gilgo Beach killings left those who knew him in disbelief. However, the evidence against him seems substantial. The police say his DNA was linked to the crime scene, and eyewitnesses testified against him. Also, he had been in contact with several of the victims in the months leading up to their deaths. He's also the main suspect in the case of Maureen Brainard Barnes, a fourth woman who disappeared in the same area back in 2007, though no charges have been filed in that case. Hoyerman's trial is set to begin in January 2024, and if he's convicted of murder, he could be facing a life sentence in prison. Number 12. The Arsonist as a fire captain, you're expected to manage a fire station, train new firefighters, check equipment for safety, and make decisions to fight fires safely. John Leonard Orr excelled at these tasks and was even promoted to arson investigator. However, what's truly astonishing is that Orr was also a serial arsonist who started over 2,000 fires, causing millions in damages in Los Angeles. His unique advantage was his knowledge of what arson investigators looked for and how firefighters were trained. Orr's cunning strategy involved starting decoy fires in grassy hills near his intended target. When firefighters responded to these brush fires, he would then set fire to his planned locations, causing them to burn unattended for maximum damage. In 1984, a fire at Ole's home center in South Pasadena claimed four lives, including a two-year-old. Investigators initially thought it was an electrical fire, but Orr insisted it was arson because in reality, he had deliberately set that particular fire. In 1987, Orr ignited several fires near an arson investigators convention. One of the stores he tried to burn was saved by a vigilant store manager who extinguished the flames before they could spread. Investigators found a piece of paper with a single fingerprint, which matched Orr's. Law enforcement then placed a tracking device on Orr's vehicle, confirming his presence at another fire scene. He was arrested and sentenced to 30 years in prison for three counts of arson. In 1998, he was tried and received a 25-year sentence for the four deaths he had caused 15 years earlier. Number 11, Young at Heart. Up next is one wild story of someone trying to turn back the clock to their high school days in the most bizarre way possible. Back on September 2, 2008, Wendy Brown, a 15-year-old shy and blonde transfer student, walked into Ashwaubenon High School in Green Bay, Wisconsin. She seemed like your typical sophomore, wearing a pink hoodie and carrying a new school bag covered in hearts, all excited for the upcoming term. But fast forward just 16 days and she was standing in court, dressed in an orange prison jacket jumpsuit and wearing shackles. Why? Well, it turns out Wendy wasn't really 15. She was a 33-year-old mother of two. And what's crazier is that she had swiped her own teenage daughter's identity in a bizarre attempt to relive her high school days. During her short time at the school, Brown had been taking classes with kids half her age, even trying out for the Ash Walbanon High School cheerleading squad and showing up at a pool party thrown by the cheer coach. Some students did notice she looked older, but nobody questioned her since she acted just like a teenager. In the end, Brown wasn't found guilty of identity theft, but was declared mentally ill. She was sent to a psychiatric facility for three years. Number 10. Bart Whitaker, meet Thomas Bart Whitaker. A guy who seemingly had it all as a kid. Loving parents, a caring younger brother, and a life of luxury. But what did Bart want? He wanted his family out of the picture, all so he could get his hands on their money. His twisted plan began way back in 2000 with a murder-for-hire plot. It didn't pan out, but he didn't give up. Over the years, he tried again and again. Bart recruited acquaintances, school buddies, and even co-workers to carry out these horrific acts. Shockingly, some folks reported his sinister plans to the police and their families, but no one managed to stop him. In 2003, Bart eventually began faking university enrollment and jobs desperate for cash. He hired his own roommate, Christopher Brashier, to carry out the murders. But Brashier messed it up, and Bart's father survived. Bart himself ran off to Mexico and settled in a place called Soralvo, where a garrito, or cute white guy, would surely stand out. He went by the name Rudy Rios and spun tales about being a former soldier. However, 
However, a year later, he was captured. He got sentenced to death in Texas, but that sentence got changed in 2008. Bart is now spending the rest of his life behind bars. It's one messed up tale of greed and deception that ended in a lifetime of imprisonment. Over the world, literally, who have prayed for this, uh, I believe that um, God's hand was on this. Number nine, nurse of death. Let's talk about a nurse named Jane Toppin, who betrayed her profession in the most horrifying way. Jane did something absolutely macabre. She played around with doses of morphine and atropine, mixing them up, all without her patients suspecting a thing. What's even creepier is that she got a thrill from pushing her patients to the edge of death, then bringing them back to life, only to push them over that edge again. Jane had a tough upbringing. Born Honora Kelly in 1857, she lost her mother to tuberculosis when she was very young. Her father, a tailor, suffered from mental illness and even tried to sew his own eyelids shut. In 1863, her dad gave her and her sister up for adoption to the Boston Female Asylum. She ended up with the Toppin family in 1864, effectively as an indentured servant. She adopted their last name and stayed with them until she began nursing school in Cambridge in 1885. However, she got kicked out due to her almost obsessive interest in autopsies and the mysterious deaths of two patients in her care. After that, she went rogue, faking nursing certifications and running her own private home care business for nearly two decades, all while continuing her deadly act. In 1901, while taking care of an old friend, Jane killed off the patient's family one by one. The friend first, then her grandmother, and finally, her daughter. When the family's grandfather demanded an autopsy, it was discovered that all three had fatal doses of morphine in their bodies. After her arrest, Jane confessed to killing 31 people. She was sent to the Taunton Asylum in Massachusetts, where she remained until her death in 1938. Number 8. Mata Hari you know how female spies in movies can be charming and dangerous? Well, meet Mata Hari, who embodied that in real life. Back in 1905, Hari arrived in Paris and quickly rose to fame as a performer, captivating audiences with Asian-inspired dances. Her fame spread, and she toured all across Europe, spinning a story about being born in a sacred Indian temple and being taught ancient dances by a priestess who gave her the name Mata Hari, which means Eye of the Day in Malay. But here's the shocking twist. Her real name wasn't even Mata Hari, and her story about the sacred temple and ancient dances wasn't true. In reality, she was born Margareta Geertruida Zella in a small Dutch town called Leeuwarden. It turns out that her superficial knowledge of Indian and Javanese dances came from the years she spent in Malaysia with her former husband, who was a Scot in the Dutch colonial army. Now, the details of her spy career are a bit hazy, but it's believed to have kicked off around late 1915 when she was approached by Karl Kromer, the honorary German consul in Amsterdam. He saw her as a valuable asset because she had influential contacts and could freely move across national borders, thanks to her Dutch citizenship. Matahari also became a famous courtesan, and when World War I broke out, her list of lovers expanded to include high-ranking military officers from different countries. Then, in February 1917, French authorities arrested her on espionage charges and locked her up in Saint-Lazare prison in Paris. In a military trial held in July, she was accused of leaking information about the Allies' new weapon, the tank, which resulted in the deaths of thousands of soldiers. She was found guilty and sentenced to death. On October 15th, she faced a firing squad at Vincennes. Number 7. Matt Stryker when passion calls, you can't resist, right? Well, in Matthew Kay's case, that passion led him to a double life. Kay was a popular social studies teacher at Benjamin N. Cardozo High School in Queens, New York. Around the end of 2004, something strange started happening. Kay began missing work a lot, always citing medical emergencies. But here's the twist. These emergencies were more like wrestling showdowns than actual health issues. You see, Kay had a secret identity as Matt Stryker, a professional wrestler who had some unique moves like the lung blower and the overdrive. And the craziest part? He didn't hide it very well. He would fly all the way to Japan for wrestling matches, appear on TV without a mask, and his wrestling character? It was a teacher of all things. What's even more surprising is that nobody at the school seemed to notice for months. Kay kept skipping work to wrestle, and he did it 11 times before the school officials finally put two and two together. When they confronted him, Kay decided to resign before facing disciplinary action. You could say he tapped out of the situation like in a wrestling match. But here's the cool part. He didn't give up on his wrestling dreams. Instead, he shifted gears and became a successful wrestling commentator. Now that's a career move you don't hear every day. Legitimate competition, all right? 
Nobody wants to see mindless carnage. Number six, the drug kingpin. Reverend Sean Harrison was a man who wore many hats in his community. He was a minister, a high school dean, and an anti-violence advocate. But he had a dark side as an enforcer for drug dealers, a job he did during his nights and weekends. People started getting suspicious of Harrison when he had a rough day at school and ended up shoving a student. The school district was on the verge of firing him for that incident, but their concerns were quickly overshadowed by something much more sinister. A video surfaced showing Harrison shooting one of his students in the back of the head. This was a gang-related execution, and it had happened while Harrison was working his other job as a Latin King's drug trafficker. Now here's the silver lining in this dark story. Harrison wasn't particularly skilled at carrying out executions. The student he shot, who was actually working for Harrison as a drug dealer, miraculously survived. Harrison got arrested right away. And if that wasn't enough, a team of Latin Kings members got caught while trying to remove guns and drugs from his apartment. It turns out that Harrison's place was like a storage unit for the whole gang. You might be wondering, how did he manage to do all of this for so long without getting caught? Well, it seems that being an anti-violence advocate and a minister provided excellent cover when you're spending a lot of time with known gang members and drug dealers. Even when he came under police surveillance for suspected drug dealing, nothing he did raised suspicion. Until that shocking video of him shooting his student emerged. Now, it's time for today's subscriber pick. The family of four stood together in front of the photographer, smiling brightly. The husband put his arm around his wife and held his two young children close. It was the perfect family family photo. But little did the husband know that this photo would be the beginning of the end of his marriage. Later, when the wife looked at the photo closely, she noticed something that made her heart sink. Her husband was not wearing his wedding ring. Additionally, there was a faint smudge of lipstick on his collar. In that moment, the wife realized that her husband had been living a double life. She didn't know how long it had been going on or who the other woman was, but she knew one thing for sure. Their marriage was over. The next day, the wife filed for divorce. She couldn't imagine living with a man who had betrayed her so deeply. The story of the husband's double life made headlines in the local newspapers. The headline, Family Takes Photo and Wife Files for Divorce, after seeing this detail, caught the attention of readers everywhere. But do you think the wife had done the right thing by filing for divorce, or was there room for forgiveness and redemption? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section. Number 5. Pol Pot. You know, sometimes the people you didn't really pay much attention can surprise you big time. Take Saloth Sar, for instance. Back in the day, he was an admired French literature professor at Chamraon Vikea College in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, from 1956 to 1963. But then he mysteriously disappeared, leaving behind friends, family, and students who believed him to be dead. What they didn't know is that while he was Professor Saloth by day, he secretly led Cambodia's underground Communist Party, plotting its takeover. When the government cracked down on communists, Saloth vanished into the jungle and emerged as a guerrilla leader for the Khmer Rouge, adopting the name Pol Pot. Pol Pot shrouded himself in secrecy, cut ties with his former life, and even used a stand-in to pose as the leader of his rebel group. In 1975, his army overtook the capital, Phnom Penh, and his rule took a dark turn. He forced the entire city's population into the countryside, where approximately two million Cambodians were executed. Pol Pot had a particular obsession with eliminating Cambodia's intellectuals, and he even imprisoned his own family. Astonishingly, they remained unaware that their supposedly deceased relative was the genocidal dictator responsible for the horrors unfolding in their country. Number 4. The Axe Murderer Back in 1951, the Swedish town of Saxtorp was going through a nightmare. You see, there was this axe murderer on the loose, terrorizing the place. When word got out and the whole country was watching, they turned to Tora Hedin, a well-respected Saxtorp police officer, to lead the investigation. He'd even have these press conferences to keep everyone updated on his progress. Little did they know, Hedin was the axe murderer himself. Now, Hedin's shady history started in 1943 when he stole some oats from a brewery and then burned the whole place down to cover his tracks. For eight years, he had the same routine, committing small crimes and then torching entire buildings to erase any evidence. But then, things took a dark turn. On a night when people were celebrating him at a rally, he was out robbing and murdering his friend John Nielsen. As usual, he set things ablaze to hide his crime. The town, worried and scared, put him in charge of finding the killer, not knowing it was him all along. Eventually, Hedin lost his job. 
went off the deep end, killed his parents, his ex-girlfriend, and even five elderly folks in a retirement home. He ended it all by drowning himself in a lake, leaving a confession note. Number three, Jake the Vampire. Let me introduce you to Jake Rush, a guy who appeared to be the ideal congressional candidate. He had a background as an attorney, a sheriff's deputy, and portrayed himself as a devout Christian family man. However, what his constituents didn't know was that behind this conservative image, Rush had a unique hobby. He loved to engage in role-playing as a vampire. Rush was a member of something called the Mind's Eye Society, which is essentially a club where adults engage in elaborate make-believe games. So, when he wasn't studying the Constitution or working, he would transform into Chaz Darling, an imaginary undead character with a taste for theatrics. As you can probably guess, this unusual hobby became ammunition for his political opponents. They used it against him during his campaign, and it became a hot topic. Rush initially tried to defend his role-playing hobby, claiming he never tried to hide it, but eventually it became evident that he had indeed attempted to keep it under wraps. While there's nothing inherently wrong with having such a hobby, it turns out that voters weren't too keen on the idea of electing a represented number two, Two-Faced Dudla. You know, when it comes to serious crimes, men and women are on a level playing field. Let me take you back to 2012, where we meet a woman named Andrea Dudla, who also went by Esther Cathona. She had quite the story. So, Andrea went on the run after getting slapped with a 15-year prison sentence. Why, you ask? Well, she was neck deep in some shady business, including economic crimes and money laundering. Her gang managed to pull off a 1.9 million euro fraud from a bank, among other things. They posed as legit companies, cooked up fake invoices and bank statements, and tricked banks in Hungary into lending them hundreds of millions of guilders. Dudla, along with two others, even set up fake companies to score big loans from Hungarian banks. After she disappeared, the police suspected that she was hiding in Thailand. But guess what? She was living large in the Dominican Republic under a fake identity, protected by a powerful Hungarian community. She even tied the knot with a Dominican man and had a child. But as luck would have it, her game was up on January 2023. She got caught and is now facing the consequences. Number 1. The Whiskey Robber Number one on our list is a story that's straight out of a Hollywood script, except it's entirely real. Our main character is Attila Ambrus, a Transylvanian-born ice hockey player who took an unexpected turn into a life of crime. Ambrus's journey started with a daring escape from communist Romania by hitching a ride under a freight train. He then landed a job as the janitor for Hungary's national hockey team, and surprisingly, even tried out as a goalie despite having almost zero hockey skills. In fact, during the tryout, his fellow players playfully broke his nose. But Ambrus had one thing going for him. He refused to give up. Out of sheer respect or maybe a touch of pity, they gave him a spot on the team. Despite being the worst goalie in professional hockey history, he was also known as the hardest worker in the league. But hockey wasn't where his true talent lay. It was robbing banks. In 1993, Ambrus, as the whiskey robber, pulled off 29 heists in Hungary, hitting banks, post offices, and travel agencies. He had an odd habit of leaving compliments and flowers for the female tellers as he made off with bags full of money. Surprisingly, he became a sort of anti-hero in post-communist Hungary, where chaos reigned and a polite bank robber seemed like the perfect anti-establishment figure. Fast forward to 1999, and Ambrus was finally caught when people learned that their terrible hockey goalie was the Whiskey Robber. He became a national legend. Whiskey Robber memorabilia flew off the shelves, and the hockey team proudly flew the Whiskey Robber flag at their stadium. Ambrus made a daring prison escape six months after his arrest, using a bedsheet to climb out of a window. Despite a massive manhunt, he kept robbing banks. Eventually, he was recaptured and locked up in the most secure prison imaginable. In 2012, he was released and took up an unexpected career as a pottery maker. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.